Hi guys, welcome to Question of Strength. Let's talk training. So today, as as always, my goal is to, of course, answer your questions, but also share some either things I found out this week, some things I'm doing, explaining why I'm doing them, or maybe covering a topic that will help you in uh, any training goal you might have. Let's say fat loss, drinking, stuff like that. And so obviously, I will start with uh, my findings for the week. And by the way, the more questions you post in that chat section, the more the more interesting answer you're going to get. Uh, so it's entirely dependent on you whether this turns out to be a good hour or a very long one, right? Uh, I can be an entertainer if I need to, but I much prefer to answer your questions. All right. Uh, two topics I want to cover today. The first one is uh, when it and I covered this last week in that all caloric deficit are not equal, meaning that if you can keep more food in with the same deficit, uh, the whole fat loss process is going to be much easier. You're going to get less cravings, less metabolic adaptations, less uh, behavioral changes that will decrease daily caloric expenditure. So that makes fat loss easier. And also there's a much less chance of a rebound once you get back to your regular or non fat loss rate, okay? So basically, the more you have to cut calories to create the deficit you want, uh, the harder it will be. The more likely you are, to have, you are to have cravings, metabolic adaptations which slow down metabolic rate, and behavioral changes that will decrease uh, how much you're moving during the day, which also will decrease how much calories you're burning every day, making it harder to eat fat. It will also have a great chance of affecting your skin, your libido, your mood, and so on and so forth. So really what we're looking for, if you want to maximize the chances of a successful fat loss phase, is to try to create that deficit through an increase in activity level, as much as possible. Of course, I understand that uh, not everyone is, mostly an influencer now and, uh, let's say, um, a teacher who has lots of time to train and move around like I do. But the fact is that there are always some strategies you can use to move a little bit more. And I'm going to be covering those in, in this segment. Uh, so the first one, again, these are strategies that are very easy to implement. You don't have to implement all of them. But of course, the more of them you implement, the higher your activity level will be. Now, what I'm looking for is not necessarily increasing the amount of training you're doing on a daily basis or weekly basis. Increasing training obviously makes it harder to recover from. And if you are in a calorie deficit, even though you're trying to keep your food high, uh, you're still not recovering as easily from, let's say, a lifting workout. So when I'm saying you need to increase how much energy you're expanding daily, it does not necessarily mean having a higher volume of lifting training, although that can be a strategy that would be used at some point in, in your diet phase, okay, but not for the whole process. What I'm looking for is really strategies to increase what I call background physical activity. Background physical activity refers to how much low stress movement you're doing every day. Now, people tend to equate that with the number of steps you're taking every day, and that certainly is a big part of it. Because the more you are walking, of course, the more you're moving, but it can also include other stuff like doing chores, uh, washing the dishes, like things that basically the body is moving instead of just sitting and being on a computer, for example. Any movement actually increases caloric expenditure to some extent. Of course, it's not large, but then again, if you add all these pieces together, it can pile up to something pretty interesting. So let's look at some strategies you can use to increase the amount of physical activity, background physical activity you are doing in your day without affecting your schedule too much. Now, the first one is, uh, is, is I think it's the most interesting one. Uh, I've covered it in the past in an article on testosterone. Um, it's to make your rest periods when you're lifting active rest periods rather than passive one. What do I mean by that is let's say you're doing uh, 20 sets in your workout. Let's say uh, you're training two muscles on that day and you're doing 10 sets per muscle for 20 work sets. Now, you might be resting, let's say, two minutes, between two and three minutes between work sets. Uh, so instead of just sitting there talking to 
other people in the gym or, or watching the TV, watching your cell phone, watching your smartphone, uh, you would actually spend those two or three minutes mostly being physically active. Uh, for example, you could go on a treadmill or a stationary bike and just walk at a decent pace. I wouldn't say like slow pace, but not a fast pace either. This is not training. It's essentially your regular walking pace. Maybe there was a slight incline uh, for most of the rest period. So let's say you're resting two minutes in between sets. You would spend 90 seconds, for example, being active. If you're resting three minutes, it would be two minutes and a half active. And then you just regroup for your set. Now, what you're looking for is obviously a level of effort that will not impair your lifting performance. Just walking speed will not in any way, shape, or form negatively impact your recovery from both set to set and the workout. But it doesn't sound like much. But if you are doing the, the aforementioned 20 sets total in a workout, so 10 sets for two muscle groups each, uh, it, it can pile up pretty fast. Uh, it, easily add something like, let's say, 2,400 or right up to 3,000 steps in that, in that workout without adding any time because you are already resting those two or three minutes. So instead of just sitting there, you are walking. So it does not extend the length of the workout. You're not spending more time training, but you are using most of that time being active. Uh, and again, that's 2,400. 2, thousand steps that's a big chunk of the let's say ten thousand you're shooting for okay so that would be the first strategy of course not everyone can uh do that active rest period on a treadmill because commercial gyms being what they are sometimes the, the equipment is not in the same place or if you walk away from the machine you might, you might get stolen something like that but what you can do is just walk around the gym at, at a, a slightly faster pace than normal, normal walking speed and you can just do rounds and it looks weird, but it, it, I mean, what do you care what other people think, what you think, you're getting results, right? Once you get like that lean shredded six pack, they all will flock. What are you asking what the heck you're doing? And walking around the gym between sets would be a part of the answer, okay? So that would be my first strategy. The second strategy I, I got from Stan Efferding. Uh, basically, another very simple one, if very easy to implement, is after every main meal, you just go for a 10 minutes walk. And that will first, again, if you do that with only three meals a day, which is what most people can, uh, that will again increase your step count pretty interestingly. For example, if you do 10 minutes uh, after three meals in your day, that will have around 2,000 steps more in that day. So it, it piles up pretty quickly and it, it makes it a lot easier to reach those 10,000. But 10 minutes is nothing. Even if you're working on a clock and you have, let's say, an hour and a half for lunch, well, it, it won't take you 90 minutes to eat your lunch. Maybe it takes you 30 minutes. So you have 10 minutes just to work. It, it's very simple. Okay? Uh, same thing in the evening. And the cool thing is that it actually helps with digestion. Uh, so it, many, many benefits. Okay? So that would be my second strategy. The third strategy, again, is something that you can do with every workout that you should probably be doing anyway, is adding uh, some aerobic activity as a warm up and maybe as a cool down. And it doesn't have to be long, it's five to 10 minutes. Uh, first, it, you should probably be doing that anyway because it's better to exercise movement when the body temperature is higher and blood flow has increased to the muscles. So doing that aerobic activity prior would actually help. And we don't want an intensity level that will make you weaker for your workout. Uh, so we're still again looking at, let's say slightly faster in walk pace, that walking pace, but not so fast that you cannot have a conversation. If you are out of breath trying to have a conversation, the intensity is a bit too high. And okay? that's the way I, I use to program intensity for that. So you would do, let's say 10 minutes, before the workout as a warm up, that's actually a pretty good prep for the session. And then you might get had another five or even 10 minutes as a cool down after your workout. It doesn't sound like much because you're already accepting that you have a block of time that you're devoting to your training. Adding, let's say, 15, 20 minutes to that block of time is normally manageable for most people. I'm aware that some people might don't have a schedule, it might not be possible, but I would say that for 80, at least 80% of the people going to gyms, it is perfectly doable. And then again, you have another 
1,200, 1,500 steps in your day. Uh, so if you like use all three strategies together right from the start, you are like more than halfway to your 10,000 step goal, which would be very easy to do just by doing overall active. Now, there are other strategies you can add to those two main ones. First is a warm-up circuit. And that's what I started doing uh, when I got more into boxing training. Uh, I, I figured first that my conditioning uh, was not up to par. I also found that hitting the heavy bag uh, when my shoulders have, uh, and arms have not been properly warmed up uh, was not necessarily a pleasant experience. First, because it hurt. And second, because I was very inefficient. Uh, so I started doing a, a, a warm-up routine to basically prepare the shoulders, the hips, the hands, uh, even the legs for the striking to come. So what I would do was uh, basically a circuit of several exercises. I'm using uh, like an elastic band. You can see those dr some drills on, on, on YouTube, like a boxing drill with the bands and stuff like that, like displacement, shoulder rotation, punches, stuff like that. Like grapplers also use them a lot. Uh, I will actually be posting video on, on uh, of that circuit um, that I'm doing uh, in a few weeks in, in, in the article I'm working on. Uh, but it doesn't have, you don't have to use that circuit. Basically, I'm doing exercises that I find to transfer pretty well to my striking, okay? So, so basically, I'm doing something like six exercises, up to six to eight exercises done for 30 seconds each, okay? And it's a circuit, so it's non-stop. And it piles up and it, it comes up to something like Say three to four minutes of continuous work, which first it, it really warms me up. It continues the warm up process, but also it, it basically warms the specific joints I'm working on. So you want to make those exercises choices um, adapted to what, you, what you're doing in the gym. So I started doing that for boxing, uh, like just three to four minutes, but again, that does increase your expenditure because it's pretty intense. Um, and I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to be using that prior to every single workout I'm doing, even the strength workout. And it turns out that it really makes my strength lift feel better. But that's not the goal. The goal is simply that I, I actually want to be better conditioned. And that's really four minutes of continuous work, uh, fairly intense, fairly fast. So that really helped me be able to do a whole round of, of proper boxing. So again, that also increases energy uh, expenditure. So you can have your own strategy of a circuit lasting three to four minutes continuously. Uh, it could be stuff you want to work on. It could be stuff you need to work on. Uh, but that will also obviously increase calorie expenditure pretty decently at the end of the week if you do that, if you do that a few times a week. Uh, next, next tip, and that's, what, that's one you've heard a lot of times in the past. I, I would say that most people know about this, but yet very few people actually implement it. And what I'm talking about is taking the long way out. Basically, let's say you're going shopping. Instead of looking for the closest parking space to the, uh, to the entrance, look for the furthest uh, parking spot. So that will let you actually have to walk a bit more, maybe three, four times more, right? Uh, so as much as possible, make it slightly harder on yourself. If you need to go to uh, like a few floors up, take the stairs instead of the elevator. You've all heard that before, but very few people actually do it. It piles up. It does make a difference at the end of the week, at the end of the month. People stop doing that because they figure, well, I'm going to burn like two calories more uh, if I'm taking the long part, the, the, the longest road. Sure. But if you add all, you know, all these little pieces, it can be something very significant. At a bonus, the furthest parking spot is normally very easy to park in because nobody wants to park there anyway. That's a bonus. Next strategy. Uh, whenever you can, walk, don't drive. Interesting data from uh, cities where it, where, what I would call walkable cities. Okay, Cities where uh, most people walk because everything is at walking distance. They walk to the grocery store, they walk to their job and stuff like that. And these cities compared to the non-walkable cities, which is more spread over uh, or people just don't walk as much they show uh, normally a 10 to 20 percent lower rate of obesity and much lower rate of diabetes and metabolic um, problems right so that that is significant i've i've witnessed that myself a lot when i go to give seminars in europe uh, in europe it is i don't know if it's the way the cities are built or just their culture 
people walk a lot more. Okay? You see a lot more people walking for the grocery, shopping for anything. Uh, and you see people walking around all the time and they are much leaner than North American. That's, of course, the nutrition is different also. They have less processed food. Even the same, if you're buying like cereal, even if you buy the same brand in Europe, there's a lot less crap than in North America. It's just different. Uh, but the, the walk is a huge part of our lifestyle. And again, it shows it in body condition. For example, this one, I'm at the grocery store. I had a 45 minutes walk more out there. And as much as possible, I go there on foot. If I have a grocery list, then I, I will take a car because I just can't carry all the bags. Personally, I like to go to the grocery store every day and just buy a small amount of what I want to eat that day. Uh, it keeps things fresher, but also it makes it easier to avoid overeating. Uh, and bon added bonus, it, it makes it a lot more easy to go there, walk to the park, it's like 50 minutes, uh, it will just for something useful. And I thought, you know, I have steps from that. Steps from that. It's add on. It's, it's mostly a change in uh, mindset of one of the opportunity to walk and drive. Also, one thing I noticed myself is something that really helps is uh, get involved in a recreational sport. Uh, in my case, I got involved in martial arts and boxing. Uh, first, because I've always been a fan of fighting, but also because it's something that I can do with my son. So that's the main reason, really, but it gave me something else to do, which is fun. So the thing the hour you spend at boxing class, or the hour you spend at MMA class, or the hour you spend playing basketball, or the hour you spend at badminton or pickleball, or whatever you want to do, uh, it doesn't feel like I'm forcing myself to do physical work. You enjoy it, it's fun. Uh, but it also significantly increases your energy expenditure for the day and obviously for the So that's something you should get involved in. Last point. Be serious with that one, get a dog. If it's getting a dog, it kind of forces you to take a walk unless you are that kind of owner that just look at their dog uh, lying on the floor and just don't do anything with them, which is a bad owner. Uh, but it does, quote unquote, force you to go at least take a 30 minutes walk a day. And 30 minutes, you can get uh, steps, uh, you like that. Uh, so that that pass on again, it just added up. Like, there's never one strategy that will give you all you need. The more of you can implement, of course, it requires changing in, in your lifestyle. But the more of these strategies you can implement, uh, the easier it is to increase your background and productivity without even. Uh, uh, there are already some good questions. I just had one quick topic to cover. Something that. Uh, my friend Paul Carter posted about on his Instagram recently, and it's something I've written about in the past and also talked about in seminars in the past, is how much muscle can you build? And to me, uh, that's important to know. Uh, because I think the most important people who are training, who are satisfied with their training, and basically spinning their wheel, never progressing, because they're constantly changing and look, looking for the magical answer because they think their training is working is unrealistic expectations. Okay? They, they expect that they can gain that amount of muscle. When they only gain that amount, they figure, well, it's not working. I need to do something else. Uh, and maybe they get discouraged and stop doing all together. Uh, but that just comes from the fact that people uh, believe they can build muscle at a much faster rate than it's actually possible. And of course, when people try to do both at the same time, build muscle and get lean, you are slowing down the process even more. So you could actually be progressing very well for the, with your program, but believe you're not, just because it's not living up to its, your expectation. It kind of reminds me of uh, a friend of mine who owned a supplement store and would tell me those stories about a guy, for example, a guy uh, bought some creatine, and after a week and a half, he returned the product because he only gained four pounds. I mean, dude, <laughs> seriously, right? Uh, it was expected like what 20 pounds in the first week of creatine use. Dude, it, the story don't do that. Like, well, tell me about uh, a guy who, who bought like a two pound jug of protein powder and he was pissed because when he was done with a whole bottle, he only gained half a pound. 
or one pound. He was actually at least four pounds. Too. There's literally two pounds of powder. You cannot you cannot make four pounds from two pounds, right? So uh, unrealistic expectation it leaves a lot of poor behavior for uh, So really, what you're looking at is two different things. First, how much muscle you can build in your career. What's your potential for muscle growth? And second, what is uh, a, a was a realistic uh, rate of progression or rate of muscle growth? Okay, these are two different things, but there are some associated. And again, keep in mind that I'm talking about the average person, which is roughly something like 75% of the population. There will always be outliers on both sides of the spectrum. You're going to have, let's say, 10 ish percent that will respond slightly better, 10 ish percent will respond slightly worse. Okay. And then going to have that let's say, very small percentage that will be either hyper responders or hyper responders that, that almost don't respond at all. And you have that 0.1% on each side, which are the genetic tweaks. And the 0.1% uh, on the uh, positive side of the muscle growth spectrum will be the guys who basically look like bodybuilders, like they just build muscle looking at weights. And the 0.1% on the other side will be those who, regardless of what they do, they just can't build muscle. On the other side, they tend to be pretty good endurance athletes. Okay. Now, if we're looking at how much muscle we can build uh, toward your training career, and it's funny because Paul, Paul, myself, and also Will Brink, who's a super smart dude who's been around for, I think, I think at least 30 years in, in this field, probably even longer, because he was around when I started out like 28 years ago, uh, he's a pretty smart dude, and we all came up with the exact same number separately without actually looking at the other people's work. Uh, and it's roughly between say, 30 and 40 pounds of potential muscle gains for male. Women will be around 60 to 70 percent of that, or let's say, let's say, three quarter of that. Uh, best case scenario. So we're talking about 30 to 40 pounds of hard muscle tissue throughout your training career. Of course, we're talking about guys who are natural. If we're enhanced, it does quite a bit. Okay, so 30 to 40 pounds of hard muscle tissue. Also understand that this doesn't mean body weight. Uh, typically, someone who gains at 30 pounds of muscle will probably gain 40, 45, 40 pounds, 45 pounds of body weight, even without getting fatter, because they're storing more muscle glycogen, they have probably more uh, vascular tissue, they have and so on and so forth. Maybe because of tension because of the size of uh, but, but there are stuff coming for any pound of muscle tissue, right? And of course, if you gain some fat, you can actually, for example, if you gain 30 pounds of muscle and gain five pounds of fat, you can actually look leaner. So you think, I'm not gaining fat. The reason is that the bigger muscles make you look more separated, more defined, even if you gain five pounds of fat. And in fact, your body fat percentage might be lower because you gain a lot more muscle than you gain fat. So, so it's quite possible that you gain 30 to 40 pounds of muscle on the scale, it might show up as something like 50 or 60 pounds without looking noticeably fatter, right? But hard muscle tissue, 30 to 40 pounds in your training career, okay? Now, most of that can be gained in the first three years of hard training, okay? Uh, and proper training. You need to just train on and on, on and off, and, and don't pay attention to nutrition, don't train that hard. Let's say the first three years of solid, uh, sustained training, you can achieve uh, almost 80, 90% of that maximum amount of muscle growth. Okay? Uh, and of course, the more experienced you become, the more muscle you've built, the slower the rate of progress comes. That's where I find uh, the, the, the a da a data by or, or table by uh, Alan Aragon very interesting. He looked at what beginners can hope to gain, what intermediates can hope to gain, and what advanced lifters can hope to gain. And for example, for him, beginners, lift, beginner lifters can gain between 1 and 1.5% 1 of their body weight in muscle. Month. So if you are, let's say, let's say you have a beginner, he's 165 pounds, he can gain between 1.6 and something like 1.8 or 2 pounds of muscle per month. So 
that when he, when he shifts to the intermediate stage, uh, he, he has gained those. Uh, I'm not sure I've been training hard for a year. Uh, intermediate can gain 0.5 to 1% of their body weight per month. That's the ideal situation. Ideal situation. I'm doing everything possible to maximize muscle growth, not trying to cut and bulk at the same time, right? And an advanced lifter will gain even slower at 0.25 to 0.5. Uh, so what it could look like in reality, for example, you have someone who starts training properly, let's say he's 165 pounds. In his first year, he could actually gain 20 pounds of muscle tissue. Let's say he goes up to 185. Okay? I'm not counting any added body weight. It's just simpler to understand the concept, right? So he goes from 165 to 185. Now he's in an intermediate. He can gain 0.5 to 1 body weight. So he might gain an additional 10 to 12 pounds in that year. Let's say he go from he goes from 185 to 195 after his second year. His third year is now more advanced, so the, the rate of growth will be 0.25 to 0.5. So we can go, let's say, in a year from 195 to 200. Uh, so in those three years, he has gained something like, um, I mean, here, 2010, let's say, uh, 30, 35 pounds. 35 pounds out of, or 30 pounds, or 35 roughly. Of the 40, you know, gain. So of course, he's going to spend a whole rest of his training career trying to gain that extra five pounds of muscle. Okay? And that's pretty much what happened. Of course, nobody, not everybody has a linear progression. So, for example, some people might start out really, really hard. They gain, like, say, 20 pounds in the first year. Then life, life happens. So they only gain two pounds this year. So, yeah, you can actually gain more for longer because you're not at your potential. Like, let's say that 30, 40 pounds yet. Right, but if you train like very hard, you do everything nutrition and recovery wise to maximize muscle growth. You could very well gain that thirty pounds in the first year of training. After that, it becomes much slower. Right, so it, it, it's it's important to understand that even if you are, let's say, you are an intermediate lifter, you can probably hope to gain something like a pound of muscle a month, a pound, a pound and a quarter, something like that. So expecting to gain it, I'm going to be training hard for three months, I'm going to be gaining 20 pounds. It's not going to happen. Even 10 is not going to happen, right? You can gain that, you can gain more body weight. But if you're actually gaining close to 10 pounds in two months, you're likely adding water or fat, or probably, probably fat, right? So it's just, it's important to be able to have realistic expectation and also it's better to value the program properly if, if it's working, if you're gaining or not. All right, let's get to your question. Hi, coach. I currently train uh, five times a week, weights and soccer. Okay, so you, you train with weights five times a week, soccer twice a week. Is 300 grams of carbs enough? What is a typical hybrid athlete to train typically need for carbs? It depends. Uh, first, are, are you gaining weight? Are you, is your body weight stable? Is your body weight going up? And that's a big part of, of it because it's not everybody processes food the same way. Also, you're telling me about your training level, but you don't mention background physical activity. As I mentioned earlier, that's a big part of the equation. It could account for as much as four to 500 calories in your day. So if you're very active, you could actually be, quote unquote, burning 400 calories more than someone who's sedentary outside of his training. So there's a big, big, big variation here. So really, are you progressing? What is your body weight? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going down? How's your energy level? So really, you need to look at how you're reacting. If your body weight is stable or even going up, it's, it's, it's enough. Uh, if it's going down and your energy level is down, it might be too low. I, I, that's literally the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry if I can't be more precise. There is just not, you are doing that. You need 395 grams of carbs. It just doesn't work like that. Okay, just look at how you progress. Coach, have you ever woken up after sleeping eight hours, but your body doesn't want to get out of bed? Absolutely. And that's less fatigue or inflammation. It could be actually the, 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 the core quality of sleep, just the fact that you, just because you slept for eight hours doesn't mean it was restorative sleep. Maybe you didn't get as much deep sleep as you wanted. 
Uh, also, look at your body weight in the morning. Uh, personally, that happened. That happens to me, and it does happen. Not super often, but it does happen at least once a month. And when it happens, my body weight in the morning is always down by something like three pounds, three or four pounds even. Uh, and that also happened to a, a pro football player I was training. I would find that he felt like crap. Because when I train people online, uh, they, they have to send me every day, in of 10, how good they're feeling. Uh, and every time I would see a five or a four, the body weight will always be down, okay? And, and of course, that's not muscle loss. That might be glycogen depletion, but it's more often than not a decrease in water level. And probably, most probably, a lower level of electrolytes. So I found personally that one big factor, unless you're actively lose weight and really reduce the calories, uh, one of the cause that fatigue is really hydration and electrolyte imbalance. And for example, yesterday that actually happened to me. I mean, I felt literally dead when I woke up. I went to bed at 8 p.m. and woke up at 7. So, pretty freaking long night of sleep. But I was literally three and a half hours lighter than I was usually, uh, that I usually am in the morning. And like my, my face was gowned. Uh, and it just had no energy to drive. And when I woke up this morning, because yesterday I, I did electrolytes, I didn't eat water intake, I also took in a bit more carbs than usual. I woke up at my normal body weight this morning and felt amazing. Just had a great boxing workout. Actually, voluntarily, on purpose, did the assault bite. That tells you something. Again, I would never do it. Like crap. So, so that's one big part. Okay, just like if you go on a keto diet, people often say that the first week they get like flu-like symptoms, they feel like they have no energy, no drive, they go to the keto flu. Nine times out of ten, it's because they have low electrolytes and dehydration. Because when you go on a keto diet, you just flush a lot of water and with it come the electrolytes. So that's one thing I would consider. Could be set, could, could be CNS, it could be inflation. I, I would not discount that. Uh, especially if you've been training hard, uh, could be uh, low calorie stores, uh, but I would say that the one factor that people neglect is hydration and electrolytes. I want to walk 10,000 steps to lose weight. Uh, is baseline step number, or they should gradually increase the step as you get better, like progressive weight? No, walking is not training. I mean, going from 2,000 steps to 10,000 steps is not going to drain you. It, it, it's, it's a low stress, low effort activity. There's no need to gradually titrate up to that. I would say that the only reason you might want to just gradually increase it is just because maybe going from, let's say, 2,000 or 3,000 to 10,000 is requires a pretty significant lifestyle change or change in your schedule, change in your habits. So you might just change one habit at a time, make sure that it sticks. But but from a physiological standpoint, there's no reason uh, to do that. I mean, for example, my wife and even I, oftentimes we have days when we have 20,000 steps. And we don't feel worse than the day before we, when we get 10,000. Okay, then that, that question again. What is your thought about Mike Menzer's IT routine? Um, what I say that because every single Instagram live I'm doing, I always get the Mike Manzer question. Okay? Um, now, you mentioned his ideal routine. Are you referring to Mike's own evaluation of what his most productive routine was or what he considers to be the ideal, ideal routine, which would be his heavy duty program? Because that's a different answer. Uh, first, Mike's, by his own admission, his best gain came from training four days a week, splitting the body in half, and doing between six and ten work sets per week for body part, okay? which is far, far from what he recommends in his heavy duty book. But one thing you need to consider is that when he wrote heavy duty, he had been not out of bodybuilding for a while, but out of training. He wasn't himself not training much, if at all. Right? Peak Mike Manzer, 1975 to 1980, 
when he had one of the greatest physiques in the world. My favorite physique, personally, of all time. Uh, it, the, the way he was training was very, very different than what he wrote in heavy duty, even more different than the consolidating heavy duty. As I mentioned, heavy duty was training once or twice a week doing one set per muscle. Okay? Uh, the consolidated routine is even lower than that because it was training once a week or once every 10 days, right? doing two sets per workout. Uh, the way he built his physique was training four days a week, splitting the body in half. He was doing no volume, especially compared to guys like Arnold at the same time, who was doing between 18 and 30 sets per muscle per week. Um, his six to 10 sets per muscle per week is very, very low, but it's still two, two three times, four times more than the worst feminine is in heavy duty. Manzer, 1975, 1980s training from a volume standpoint. The structure is not the same, but from a volume standpoint, very similar to the amount of work that Dorian Yates did. So, and other guys like Andre Rada are doing a similar volume. Uh, so, so to me, that is an adequate training routine for maximizing muscle without spending your life in the gym or training your, your recovery. Uh, but anything lower than that, when you put duty side of things to me that just you know to properly program. I think that what happens is a lot of people get on that, uh, and the first two or three weeks they get good results, mostly especially the strength, because they're just recovering from being overly fatigued from their previous training. But they soon hit a plateau. But Pete Menzer, 1975 to 1980, is a pretty good application of what I call effort-based training. Uh, now, if you go on tnation.com, I have a series of articles on hypertrophy, in which I cover volume-based, effort-based, and load-based training. If you look at the effort-based hypertrophy article, I explain exactly that type of training. And the um, original manager's way of training, just like also uh, Dornier's way of training, just like uh, the DC training, just like what do training, it all fits in that category. And that's, that's pretty important if you apply properly. But lower than that, going to have a hard time progressing. Fildaro uses visual barefoot shoes opinion on using barefoot shoes in training like in the gym, the barbell lift. Personally, I always train barefooted. Uh, it's, well, I say always. That's not 100% accurate. When I train in the gym, uh, I, I, I do wear shoes because I don't have a choice. They have a rule, right? But now I'm doing, I want to say at least 75% of my workouts at home. So I'm doing all these workouts barefooted. I mean, I'm barefooted right now. I, I pretty much never wear shoes unless I have to. So in that regard, I, yeah, yeah I, I would probably, if I spend more time in gyms, uh, training in gyms, I, I would probably invest in minimalist shoes. Absolutely. I really, I'm a strong believer in that. First, it does feel better. For, it just feel better to me. I, I like to feel grounded. But also, foot strength is one of the most neglected factors in athletic performance. Uh, for example, if you have to run, imagine that your, your foot is like a trampoline. So if, if it's strong, if your foot is strong, when you hit the floor, it just have a rebound effect. If you're weak, it just crumbles and dissipates energy. You're losing a lot of the plyometric effect. So it slows you down, both for agility and speed. Also power. Also have a strong foot, allows you to apply more force into the ground, either when doing the big lift, or by when you are fighting an opponent. Obviously, Phil is a, a fighting coach, fighting strength and conditioning coach, but that's a big part of it. But I'm a strong, strong, strong believer in training. If you go on the Saskatchewan Nation and you see some pictures of myself training, uh, most of the time, I'm not wearing shoes. And I'm, that's been, I've been like that for at least, what, 12 years. The only time I would wear shoes on purpose, uh, regardless of the situation, is if I'm doing Let's say full snatches or full clean, because I need the extra heel to have the mobility to go into a full squat uh, to catch the bar low and see that right. But if I'm, even now, I'm doing, when I'm doing power snatches, I'm, I'm, I'm barefooted. What's your morning routine immediately after getting out of bed? Well, that really doesn't apply to most people because it's mostly getting the kids ready to school. Uh, but, but typically, I do wake up normally at 30 minutes earlier than them. Uh, so I just... I don't do anything special. I'd like to tell you that I'm using like uh, ultra red light therapy, which I should be using. I just never bought the unit, but I really believe in that. Uh, 
normally if it's in the winter, I like to see the sun as early as I can. The problem is that now it's dark. I wake up at like 36 and it starts until 7 because in Canada we have a thing called winter. Uh, and in the winter, it's dark earlier and it's, uh, it's dark earlier in the night and it's, the sun sets much later. Much later, so that's why I might invest in a red light uh, light therapy. I, I'm a strong believer in that. I just don't do it right now. Uh, but what I'm doing, I'm not doing anything special. I, I want to see the sunlight. Um, I'm, I'm taking my breakfast. I'm doing work. I mean, I'm doing email. Doing, for example, this morning, I, I had email work done. I'm answering some questions. And I also started working on uh, my next seminar. So that's typically what I'm doing. Then I just wake up and it's a good morning routine. Opinion on my morning routine: Wake up, go to the bathroom, weigh myself. Yeah, I do that also. I always weigh myself in the morning after uh, the first urination. Not because I'm uh, super focused on my weight. It just as I mentioned earlier, I know that if my weight is significantly down, let's say three or four pounds in the night, I know my my, my day is going to be really bad. All right, uh, myself drink glasses of water. Sure, uh, I would actually not have just water. I would have electrolytes with that. It's not the water that's the issue, although yes, you wake up normally dehydrated, add electrolytes. That's one thing I didn't mention. I always have electrolytes in the morning when I'm drinking. Always, 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 always. What do you think about the chest bar pull up? I've never been able to get the full retraction. Is this detrimental to my shoulder? No, it's not. And what exercise might be best for taking it? Uh, well, first of all, uh, not everybody has the levers to do that movement properly. I mean, everybody can do it, but for some people, it's going to be a lot harder than others. For example, because of my leg my arm, which is very short, like T-Rex territory, not only that, my um, humerus is much longer than my arm, proportionally speaking, uh, much shorter, sorry. But for me, getting a chest, it, it's very, very hard. Like Literally, twice as much work as someone with, with longer arms. I just have bad lever uh, in that range of motion. So even if my back and my arms are the strongest, it's almost impossible for me to get a proper chest bar pull-up. Uh, anyway, if you can do a proper pull-up, like chin over the bar, proper technique, you're good. Everything works. That little extra range you can get with cedar rowing from a, from a muscle development perspective. You're not missing that much. Uh, that, that's all I have to say about. Uh, what's the best in speed for walking? I don't know. As I mentioned, it depends on the person. To me, the best intensity for a walk is as intense as you can while still being able to hold a conversation. If you are the breath by, by when, when talking, it, it's too intense. So what's your opinion on getting a cheap treadmill at home and stand up desk and walk while using a computer? Sure, my, 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 uh, I have a friend who does that. Uh, he does lots of online consults, lots of uh, online work, and he always walks on the treadmill when doing that. Uh, personally, I do that when I'm doing, for example, uh, Q and A's, the Q and A's I'm doing right now. I also do them on my Instagram Live. And when I do, I'm walking on a treadmill. If I do a podcast, I often do it on a treadmill walking. Because to me, it actually makes me better at entering stuff. Uh, but if I had to work on a computer, like type stuff, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I talk to pro and boxers. They run three miles minimum every day. Is there a chance for overtraining to boxing sessions and strength sessions? Uh, not if you work, work up to that. And again, it also depends. If you, you're talking about pro web pro. So you do have high level amateurs, but uh, like a high level amateur is essentially a professional in that he devote, his whole schedule is geared toward fighting or training. Uh, so that means that they don't have the same stress as most people do. Training, don't see it. Uh, overtraining is not training too much. Overtraining is really a syndrome you develop over time because you have an excessive amount of stress imposed to your body. Some of that stress can be training, but a lot of that stress can be lifestyle related. For someone with a very low lifestyle stress, 
because they are full-time athletes, uh, they can do can do especially if they gradually work up to it. But someone working a regular job with a family, it's probably too much because it, his overall background stress is already pretty high. Again, also don't don't forget that elite athletes are elite for a reason. Okay. They are probably born with some genetic advantage. For example, I remember I was training with CrossFit athletes. Uh, and her greatest gift, she, she went to the games a few times, uh, her greatest gift was that she could not be outworked. And I, I'm, uh, I mean, I've trained athletes in 22 different sports, Olympians, for athletes. I've never seen anybody, anybody who trained remotely close to how much she was training. She was literally doing CrossFit work, which included strength work, injury work, at least six hours a day. So it was literally a full-time job for her, and she was recovering fine. Uh, she would go through training partners like every every week was a new one because they just couldn't follow her, even though they were themselves pretty good athletes. So you need to understand that what the elites are doing is often is often and what you can be doing simply from a genetic standpoint. So some people just have the capacity to withstand a huge amount of work without detriment. Okay, uh, I'm not like that, especially when you get the conditioning work in. Strength work, I can end up pretty much, but uh, as you know, when you do conditioning, my work capacity decreases. Uh, so it, it really looking at what the best we're doing is probably not the ideal uh, way of planning your I came up with Black Friday sale, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I, I also had a VIP option on my Instagram. Uh, basically, if you join the VIP list, you have an extra 5% off from uh, the Black the Friday sale. That will be, I think, not next week or something like that. But yeah, it's a pretty significant one. Rambo, I'm going to actually answer questions from other people. Basically, monopolize everything. When I get back to you afterwards, probably. Yeah, after work, after working out, I am pretty irritable, stressed out for the next few days. Um, I don't take any supplements at all. Well, uh, that could be several things. If it was, no, I didn't. Um, I'm sorry about um, what do you think about it? So first, uh, if you would have said that you were irritable and stressed out like a few hours after the workout, that would have been pretty simple. Okay, that would just be because out, your adrenaline gets up very high, and it stays high after the workout. And when adrenaline is high, you are in a fight or flight mode and put some flight. So you are in that competitive, invasion, uh, in power mood. Uh, so that can actually more aggressive, more yeah. What you stress out is anxiety. More than your neurons are in too fast to control. And the neurotransmitter that increases the speed of your neurons is mostly equivalent. So after the workout will can absolutely be anxious, irritable, uh, anxious, or whatever, right? But if it lingers a day or, or Afterwards, then the problem might be uh, uh, inflammation lead to maybe uh, inflammation in the brain also. That might be like what I would be looking at. I'm thinking uh, what strategy, one strategy I use with athletes who uh, have that stressed out feeling or anxiety feeling after workout, have them take magnesium and ice after the workout. So uh, 500, one, uh, 500 milligrams up, 1,000 milligrams of magnesium after workout. Ideally, magnesium trinate, magnesium torate, uh, then 5 grams of glycine. Uh, both will calm yourself down a little lower adrenaline. Now, the reason you might be anxious for a few days after may be because you are overstimulating those adrenaline receptors after the workout and then side effect from that. So you might try that. That might be a good way of doing it. And also having new carbs after the workout would be important. All right. Coach, you said adding cardio warm-up and co 
time during your workout session is mandatory. Nothing is mandatory. And something I need to add to see and make sure that my overall session. But you didn't get the point. Uh, when I, I mentioned the warm up and cool down, but doing some aerobic work there, it's as a strategy to increase your background physical activity without adding too much time to your day. For example, let's say you want to reach 10,000 steps while doing an extra 15, 20 minutes of work with your workout can add 1,000, 2,000 steps to your day. So that's in that context. Do you have to do that if you just want to train for strength or size? No, you don't. Although I, I, I do believe that a, a, at least a short aerobic workout, warm up, let's say even a five minutes before the workout, just to get your, your blood flow going, the increase of your fluid in your joints, and also increase uh, body temperature could be uh, uh, something effective. But there's nothing ever mandatory. The way I always see warm ups is I'm using warm ups either to make my workout better. So I'm using strategies that will help me perform better for that workout. And that strategy will be different depending on, on what type of workout I'm doing or what my problems may be. I'm also might be using that warm to work on stuff I would normally neglect. So I want to make sure that it's in, but stuff that does not negatively impact my workout. So that's something to consider. So we're talking about new, new, newbie gain yeah, earlier. I mentioned that. Uh, what's the age group for newbies gain for females? There's no such thing as a, an age group. I see a lot of females in a college gym for the first time. Beginner gains, okay? When I mentioned that you can gain 1 to 1 1.5% of your body weight in muscle per month, if you can right, the fastest rate possible is when you are a beginner. Beginner has almost nothing to do with age, okay? At least the beginner gains. Uh, the exception to that would be if you're before puberty, you don't yet have, let's say, high anabolic hormones, it's harder to build muscle, so you won't get the same beginner gain. And also, if you start training at something like 50 or 60 years of age, because the testosterone growth hormone are, are like lower now, so you don't get the same rate of gain. But besides that, let's say from and right up to like 45 years old, when you are a beginner, you are a beginner. Okay? And you can get beginner gains at any age. Uh, to me, a beginner is not about age. It's not about the age you started. It's actually not even about how much experience in the gym you have. I've seen plenty of guys in gyms who've been there for 10 years, and I still consider them beginners. Because in those 10 years I've seen them there, they have not improved one iota. They have not gained any muscle. They have not added any strength. They're basically just exercising rather than training to be the group. To me, being a beginner is basically someone who has yet to add a significant, significant amount of muscle or strength with their training. Okay? Uh, what is significant? Maybe 10, 15 pounds. Once you gain those 15 pounds, you're probably more in the intermediate level. So some people can be beginners for only six months. Some people can be beginners for 10 years. So it really depends more on how much you progress. In the All right, question. Uh, uh, did you train Michel Letendre in CrossFit? As I mentioned, no. Uh, I've worked. Quite a few CrossFit athletes, a few who went to the games, uh, a lot more who went to um, the regionals. Now, I did not train them for CrossFit. I trained them for strength and the Olympic lifts as part of the CrossFit training. So basically, the way it worked is that I, I worked at uh, three different boxes and uh, what I would do, and also worked with a, pro, a CrossFit programmer or, or whatever you know. And I would be hired to either teach weightlifting classes uh, or, or program the strength component in the overall program. So it, it's a lot like, say, boxing or whatever, right? You have the overall coach 
overall physical preparator or shrinking the clinician over the whole programming. So he decides well, in that period we need to work on that, that, that. Da, 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 da. So if he is knowledgeable in those areas, he will do the programming himself, but he will also um, hire out other, other specialists. For example, uh, me, I would be hired as a weightlifting, Olympic lifting specialist, specialist with the athletes of a few uh, physical programs. Or athletes would just hire me themselves to work on their lifts. That was my goal with CrossFit. I would never claim to be an expert in CrossFit program. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, bring more people in because Rembo is almost the only guy asking questions. So we need more of you guys. So make sure that you tune in every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time for more goodies. Hopefully, I'm going to have some cool topics and some, some cool trips for you, tips for you. And also, hopefully, you're going to have good questions for you. That's a, I, you know,